Tak nemá bůh. Welcome to the broadcast. My name is Dr. David Simmons. This is Silverado Cowboy Church, where Jesus is king of the cowboys and everybody's welcome. What that means is God has no respect for persons. We're glad you're here. Listen to the word today because the word of God will change your life. The Bible tells us that it's an inspired word of God. It was given for correction for instruction in righteousness and so we have to remember that it will change our life every time we hear it by the washing of the water of the word so listen to the word enjoy it and I'll talk to you at the end praise the Lord somebody's got testimony I just I just know it the bridge is done It's beautiful. <laughs> There's a note in my Bible. That's hilarious. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Doesn't it still excite you? Yes. Yes, it does. Amen. Is it only, has it been two years? I don't know. It's like forever. It's a blessing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> It is, it is a big thing. It, it was a big thing. That's right. I remember one time I had a, a lady, she called the church. Oh, kids can be dismissed. Excuse me. Um, she called and she said, so now where are you? I would like to come visit your church. And I, so I explained to her where I was. And she says, okay, now, now where is that? And I said, so from uh, the square, um, seven miles. She goes, oh, whew, that's too far. She goes, I said, I'm sorry, do you not have transportation? She goes, oh, yeah. She goes, I just, like, I just need church to be within a mile of me. And so I prayed with her that she'd find, right? Yeah, she'd find that church. So, you know, it was, it was that way. No, no judgment. I just, I just know how that goes sometimes, you know. It, it's a little difficult. Hallelujah. So... Let me ask a question. So um, Tim had left his Bibles over there, and I was looking for mine. So I thought, well, somebody left a bunch of Bibles there. So I'm thumbing through them, and I'm looking to see. Oh well, no, I got to go find my other one. And so I'd like to know who you just you just won't read anything but King James. Anybody? No, New King James. You like New King James? New King James is your go-to Bible. Okay, Living. Living Bible, New Living Bible, New American Standard. Oh, got a couple, got a couple, okay, yeah, no, 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 okay. Uh, Spiritual Life, right, we like the Spiritual Life Study Bible. I'm praying for them, I'm praying because I need, I need that company to sell Bibles again for me so I can buy some more without buying a thousand of them or something. Um, and so... I thought about that, you know, and how different the word reads and, and how it just, it, it just brings life. It brings life no matter what edition. I mean, I, I study out of King James all the time. And I mean, and it just, it just blesses me. And then I'll go over to another translation. Oh, I didn't mention the message. Anybody just like the message? That's all you'll read out of? I was telling youth when I bring it out, I apologize because we're trying to, we only have a certain amount of time and the message Bible is a little lengthy. So uh, try not to, you know, read out of that necessarily. But still got a lot of good word, a lot of how it expounds on that. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, I asked you all and I said, it's good to be flexible. Amen? Amen. It is. It's, it's really good to be flexible. Um, e if in, in our bodies, the more flexible, I was going to have one of the kids do a cartwheel for me across the room, and I decided that might be starting something I don't want. So, um, but, but I remember when I could do that. Now, I, I might still be able to. I'm not going to try it right now. 
but, but I might. I used to be able to do cartwheels and, and, and walk back, back bends and walkovers and, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. And I love gymnastics and um, I was really flexible. And um, I do find that in a lot of condition, if the more flexible you are, the older you get, the safer you are, your bones are stronger. Amen. Um, you, you have less chance of injury if we take care of our bodies and our bones, right? And so the same goes true spiritually in being flexible, emotionally being flexible, not being rigid, not being tied into, I just can't do that. You said that recently? I just can't do that. So I want to pray over anybody that did that because you can. You can. Amen. Um, We're going to be turning to Jeremiah 24. And I am going to be teaching out of the New Living Translation today. Hallelujah. So, um, I was, I I don't have enough space. Glory, you find that? Is there not enough space up here? We need, we need, we need more space or some, oh, here we go. I know something. Oh, I need one on the other side. Okay, fine. All right. Um, I was watching a Western, the other, Western's channel the other day, and um, they're having uh, Jimmy Stewart. It's Jimmy Stewart month. I love Jimmy Stewart. Love Jimmy Stewart in Westerns. Love Jimmy Stewart in other movies, too. And uh, this deal came on. It shows John Wayne, and he says, you know, some days it takes more courage to live than it does die. I thought about that. You know, last week, my message in, in talking about what if, you know, yeah, we're Christians, so, you know, we're supposed to be like Jesus, right? Christians, Christ-like. But what if we treated everybody like they were Jesus was my message. What if you treated everybody like they were Jesus? And so I encouraged everybody as they went through this last week. And so I don't know if that came back to you, if you were able to apply that, uh, what that looked like. And uh, I hope nobody had somebody that said, I'm glad you're not that person in their life. I'm glad you're not Jesus because I would have just failed in that miserably. I hope everybody had those people that it was just so easy to just treat like Jesus, to, to look at them and, um, you know, and, and, if, and if everybody was Jesus, what would you be doing with them, you know, right? Would you be, I'd be like inviting them over for dinner. I'd be cooking for them. I don't know what you'd be doing for them. I'd be cooking for them because uh, it's just what I love to do. And so um, I'd be figuring out ways that uh, I'd, I'd like, what can I do for you today, right? What if you did that with everybody you met? So those who weren't here last week, I'm going to leave that message with you. And we talked about um, uh, the goats and the sheep and in the word and how um, they, the Lord has so ministered to Israel from the very beginning about that part of separation. And it wasn't for the church, not for the church body, but it was for Israel that spoke to specifically. And how we can use whatever word is given and we should be applying it to our lives. I hope you don't look at it and go, oh, well, that was, that was for Daniel. Mm, that's not mine. That was for Jeremiah. I don't, I don't need any of that. And, and mercy. I come out of Exodus, so I don't even know. Read the Old Testament. It is full of powerful tools for us to reflect upon. I look back and I think, oh, mercy sakes alive. If these people could survive this, surely I can survive my washing machine going out, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, yes, indeed, all things. He gives us strength for it. Amen. And um, in uh, Jeremiah 24, 1 through 10, um, this was about 600 years ago, so I'm going to kind of set it up. Before the Christian era, uh, and the great king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, besieged Jerusalem. And um, Zedekiah was the king of Judah, uh, had sent messages to the prophet Jeremiah, who we're going to be looking at what he had to say about it, to inquire whether God would save the holy city from the enemy. 
But Jeremiah had prophesied to his people um, that that wasn't going to be the case. So after King, verse 1, excuse me, Jeremiah 24, 1. After King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon exiled um, the king and his son of Judah to Babylon along with the officials of Judah and all the craftsmen and all the artisan and, get, and the Lord gave me this vision. I saw two baskets of figs placed in the front of the Lord's temple in Jerusalem. I think about the temple in Jerusalem. And even though, you know, I've, I've not seen it, I've seen it. I've seen it. And um, it's probably, I probably couldn't even imagine really the glory of the majesty of what that's going to look like when Jesus returns. Amen? And the new Jerusalem in that place. Um, I think it was Wendy when we were there. She was like, ooh, what if Jesus came back now? Could we just stay? Yeah. Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. One basket was filled with fresh ripe figs while on the other was filled with bad figs that were too rotten to eat. When I was little, we had a fig tree. I didn't like them good or bad. So my mom loved them. She'd have, she'd have me go pick them, and she'd just eat them fresh. And, and now, I, I, there are ways I do like fresh figs. Um, and then, but the rotten ones, I mean, you pick them, and they just, just disintegrate in your hands, and they were all over the place, and it was, it was, it was not nice. And they stuck. Then the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I replied, figs. And can you imagine the king asking Jeremiah for revelation? And he goes, so, you know, he's gonna save, is God going to save us? And he goes, so what do you see? And he goes, I see figs. I'm sure that the king probably just looked at him like, not the answer I was looking for. But I love how the analogy plays out. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, verse 5. Before that in verse 4, he tells them, God gave me this message for you. And so, has God ever given you a message? Do you have a word from the Lord? Unfulfilled. Maybe a promise that's unfulfilled. Ask him for one. If you've never had God give you a word or a message, have him give, ask him for one. You know he'll give you one? He will tell you. He'll give you your heart's desire. He will certainly give you a message and a word from him. Of course, now, you may not necessarily like the message. Because he may ask you to be flexible. Or to change something. Or to grow. Or to spend more time, I don't know, doing something. Give something away. I used to love Ann and Glenn Smith. For those who didn't have the pleasure of knowing Ann and Glenn. Uh, Anne's still with us, and, but, you know, getting her over here is a little difficult sometimes. And uh, Anne come home, and her kitchen table's missing. And she's like, where is my kitchen table? He goes, well, there was this family I, I met, and, and they didn't have a kitchen table. She goes, well, why didn't you go buy them one? This is my brand, it was like brand new kitchen table. And so, um, and I mean, this, this happened to more than one thing. Automobiles, Anna come home, Glenn be giving stuff away. And uh, I imagine, and, and I asked her, I said, did you start hiding stuff? <laughs> so he wouldn't give it away. She says, you know, one thing I realized, even though I didn't always understand why he did what he did, God always blessed us. God always provided for us. And she said, and it was a testimony for me to realize that the things that I have are the Lord's. Amen? The things that we have, God gave us. Everything we have. Amen? And so Fonda used to, and I don't know that she still does it. Probably not because we don't buy them very much anymore. She used to always give away her Spiritful Life Bible. And um, um, she'd come, I need a new Bible. You have to give it spiritual life away, your Bible. And um, I carry extra Bibles. So I, if I give one away, it's not mine. Now you might think, you know, whatever you want to about that, but I'm still going to give them a Bible. I just, I like my notes. You know, I like the things that I have in here. I like the fact that I still have a note that the bridge is, yes, that the bridge is there. And so, you know, as Jeremiah um, continues to minister to the king, and the king, like I said before, is probably a little bit confused, and that's why he reminded them, I have a message for you. The Lord gave me a message. And you know that King Nebuchadnezzar, he had spoken with Jeremiah, and he knew that Jeremiah heard the Lord. 
He knew to call him because he knew he needed a word from God and he wasn't getting it for whatever reason. So again, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The good figs represent the exiles I sent from Judah to the land of the Babylonians. I will watch over and care for them. I will bring them back here again. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them hearts that recognize me as the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God for they will return to me wholeheartedly. But, verse 8, the bad figs, the Lord said, represent King Zedekiah of Judah, his officials, and all the people left in Jerusalem, and those who live in Egypt. I will treat them like the bad figs, too rotten to eat. I will make them an object of horror and symbol of evil to every nation on the earth. They will be disgraced and mocked and taunted, cursed wherever I scatter them. And I will send war, famine, and disease until they have vanished from the land which I gave them and their ancestors. And so in this I made a note uh, about the destiny that we're looking at here. And those who are inner, inwardly good, he's talking about, meet and bear trials of natural life and the temptations of the spirit. And are thereby reformed, regenerated, developed in heavenly character and in happiness while those who avoid and resist the Lord's training die in their evils and fix themselves in conditions of sorrow which they suppose they had escaped. In the prophecy, as I was talking about, um, in, in Jeremiah 21, 8 through 9, and I'm not going to turn there specifically, but I made some notes about it. It says this, the people of Jerusalem were divided into two classes. Those who accepted the Lord's word and surrendered to the Chaldeans and those who rejected the prophecy. And so this is the prophecy that Jeremiah had given and remained in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah the prophet saw that the better class of people would be carried away as captives while the worst class would remain for a worse destiny. Those who escaped captivity naturally supposed they were more fortunate than those who were made captive. So those who got left behind, so the, the, those that were listening to the Lord, they were taken captive by the Chaldeans. And so, you know, they escaped captivity. So they're thinking, whew, whew I escaped that, right? I'm, I get to stay here. Things are going to be okay. And, and the opposite was true. So those who escaped captivity naturally supposed they were more fortunate than those who were made captives. But Jeremiah showed them by the divine word of prophecy that on the contrary, the captives should finally return to Jerusalem and to prosperity, while those who persisted in remaining at the present time would be scattered abroad, lose their homes permanently, besides having to meet further and greater trials of war, famine, and pestilence. And I had mentioned um, the time here. It was 597 B.C., okay? Um, and um, the king uh, of Judah was, was taken to Babylon. Zedekiah became king. And often, um, and I made a, I thought this was interesting. Often royal officials, you know how it said it took all these people with them, the craftsmen and the artisan. Um, let me go back. Where's that at? Officials, yeah, the Babylon officials with the craftsmen and the artisans uh, were sent away. Um, often royal officials were exiled to keep them from exerting power and starting rebellion. You know, I, I wonder if sometime the presidents of the past should be exiled, right? So they don't start rebellion. There was, a, there was a thought process here. And how much rebellion we do see from nowadays. And I don't know that it's always been that way. I've been watching um, a lot of history in Smithsonian Channel the past couple weeks. So I've um, um, been, I always like to learn about our own history. And some people that I thought were, um, you know, good, you know, I, I assumed were good presidents were horrible presidents and made horrible decisions for people that directly affect us even today. Skilled craftsmen and artisan were taken because they were valuable for Babylon's building program. 
Jeremiah told of this event in um, verse 22, 24 through 28 as well. So the fresh ripe figs represented the exiles in Babylon, not because they themselves were good, but because their hearts would respond to God. And so God knows our hearts. God knows your heart. And sometimes you can, and that's why I think when the word where it says that God wants a cheerful giver, Okay, whether it's talking about tithes and offerings or helping a friend or um, stepping out of your comfort zone, that we're not, you know, murmuring and complaining and griping about it. Yeah, you know, oh, my friend called. I gotta go. I gotta go help her out. I just, I don't want to. You know, no, you know, doing it with a cheerful heart. And that was the difference here in what he was talking about. So um, I thought that that was interesting, that it wasn't about them being good or good enough. But God saw something, just as he saw in each and every one of us. Amen? I made horrible decisions when I was younger. Um, And I thank God every day that... He saw something in me. He knew my heart. I believe that. My heart was prepared for that. And um, he, he was with me through it. He didn't save me from it. It's my own fault anyway, right? But I am here today, stronger and better for it. The bad, rotten figs, those who remained in Judah or ran away to Egypt... Those people may have been arrogantly, may have arrogantly believed they would be blessed if they remained in the land or escaped to Egypt. But the opposite was true because God would use the captivity to refine the exiles. We may assume we are blessed when life goes well and cursed when it does not. But trouble is a blessing when it makes us stronger. And prosperity is a curse if it entices us away from God. I remember hearing, you know, um, there's lots of terms that are out there that describe, um, and in the Bible, how, you know, we should love adversity. I'd be like, what? (laughs) Who loves adversity? And not understanding the word at that point, but understanding that if we take adversity and if we take challenges that stand before us, we don't run away from them. But, but we go forward and through them that um, we will be stronger. I've seen too many times where people, we've prayed for them, you know, jobs, things that to, to really prosper their lives and life gets really, really good and we never see them again. And then they lose everything and they walk back in the door. And, and I'm not, do not, because if you're thinking about anybody, just erase that from your brain. I apologize um, if there's ever been anybody like that in your life. But I know that every time, praise God, they walk back through the door because they have another opportunity, right? They have another opportunity to learn. At least they know where to go back to. Amen. Amen? Because there's a lot of people that when that type of adversity comes, now they're blaming God, Right? Man, you gave me this job, and I, you know, I couldn't go to church, but, you know, I love you, and I'm going to serve you, and, and I don't, I don't, and God just goes, you know what? I love you so much that I just want you to come back. Amen? So pray for those people, if you know of people like that in, in our lives. Hallelujah. If you are facing trouble, ask God to help you grow stronger for him. If things are going your way, ask God to help you use that prosperity or that goodness for him. If you're in good health and somebody's not in good health, you can help somebody. You know, I talked about this last week, about, you know, stepping out there. And the week before as well, God had been really ministering to me personally about um, doing something more than myself. Um, with 4-H, um, I'm the archery manager for Parker County, 4-H, and um, a mom called on her way back from Rio Dosa um, in, on our officer. She's my secretary, and so um, Andy's mom was talking to me, and we were talking about some upcoming events. There was a big um, shoot this weekend in Granbury, and she said, let me ask you a question. She says, you don't have kids. 
Right? I mean, you don't have any grandkids or kids, right, in, in archery or, or 4-H? And I said, no, I don't. She goes, how did you get here? And so I shared with her that it was long ago that I wanted to do something to impact Parker County, Weatherford specifically. I wanted, I wanted to do something. I wanted to give back um, and do something because God's got, I got all these gifts. Do you have gifts? You do. You have gifts and talents? You do. You know? The automo automotive shop. You know, and how many times you've, the, that I've heard the testimony about how that's blessed, that, that, that business that was given to you. Um, the gift that Lori has of music and the cello and being able to give that gift back to the children, it blesses her. When she talks about it, she's excited. I mean, it's just, it just blesses her. The things that we're good at, the things that we love and enjoy, how can you help people use that gift to encourage them? And there's people out there because that's what God wants us to do. And so I went and I looked and lots of, I joined all different kinds of clubs and the, not the Rotary, it was Chamber, Chamber and Republican Women's and I went out to uh, uh, a Baptist church out there that has a homeschool. The homeschool co-op, the Baptist church out there. Anyway, out towards 51. Um, and they had a big homeschool group out there and we had all of our moms were homeschooling and they were young and we were doing some Mother's Day out kind of activities here at the church and, and I thought, well, you know, I love to coordinate activities and events and so I went out there to see if they needed me for anything because they, you know, had people and, and they interviewed me and, you know, I was just volunteering. I was, you know, and they, they no, no, I don't, we don't need you. So I was like, oh, okay. And then I get a phone call. Somebody would heard that I was wanting to help families to be a part of things. And so, um, long story short, I ended up becoming involved in 4-H and all that it had to offer Parker County. And now I have impacted the lives of over 200 families and 200 children throughout the past five years, six years, um, with just my gift of wanting to expose them to things that the public school system can no, no longer gives them. Can they give them? Yes, but no longer gives them. Or through parents who have to go to work and um, they, they don't, aren't afforded the luxury of being able to stay home and take care of their children. It's how, part of how that school got started up there, to be able to, to, to make a difference in the lives of people in my community. And so I never want that to change. I never want to say, well, okay, I did that, so I've done mine. <sighs> right? I've done my duty. No, I always want to be that way. And I think that's something that if each one of us had inside of us, it will inspire you to do something greater. I love that. Not because it's greater, just because I can. Just because it's God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Over in 24-6, uh, uh, where I read, the exiles in Babylon were cared for by the Lord. Although they were moved to a foreign land, their captivity was not enslavement. So when we read that translation there about captivity, it wasn't enslavement. The people could function in business. They could own homes. Uh, this is where Daniel came from. Daniel was part of that. And um, we see that in Daniel 2:48. Daniel even held a high position in the government. And so, you know, we, we, again, as we read things, when you study them, it, it looks different. Um, you ever feel like you're on a sinking ship? Have you ever been there? It's like, man, it's going down. And do I get off? Do I ride it out? What am I going to do here? Right? And, um, and <laughs> yes, flex seal. I have to ask dad how that worked. He called me the other day. Have you used Flex Seal? I said, I don't know. I got some. I don't think I've used it. I'm a commercial watcher. You know what? And if I think, I might need it, right? I might need it. Duct tape does not work. Either that or they've changed the sticky stuff on it like it used to. I don't know. Just saying. So um, I was watching the Smithsonian Channel. <laughs> 
<laughs> this has been quite some time ago. And they had a series on about the Titanic. And they were recreating the whole thing through science, through technology, uh, not based on the movie, but really what happened and, and did what happened, how that happened, how small adjustments in the captain's day, in the course of the events that took place, just very slight adjustments, that accident would have never have happened. And sometimes when, when we're in the middle of adversity or we've got things, I mean, you, you, you hit the iceberg and you've, you know, you've got a wound and it's, it's like open for you. And you're, it's just sometimes just a slight adjustment and, and you wouldn't have ended up where that was. Sometimes there's big adjustments that need to be taken place. But for the most part, and God's always telling us, just do this. And we'll never know. You know, we don't know the captain's heart. There's a lot of stories. There's a lot of uh, speculation. There's a lot of actual facts that are surrounding it. And um, everybody on the ship, though, they felt okay. You know, when, when um, they were getting ready for their, everybody was, had turned in, they were getting ready to go to sleep. Uh, the people in the lower levels, the mid-levels, it was all by class of people. Um, but when it hit, and, and everybody knew that it hit, but it, it was like it was okay. And sometimes we can hit some bumps in the road. We can kind of, and you're like, oh, oh, okay. I'm, I'm all right, though. I'm all right. And we dismiss those things in our life that we really need to be paying attention to because that slight bump, sometimes there are bumps in the road that you need to be aware of and how they may impact your life down the future. And don't ignore them just because like those who stayed behind thought that they had escaped captivity and the many other people in the Bible that I've read about as well as in my own life, I thought I had escaped. I remember Unfortunately, or fortunately, I did learn. Should we learn from our mistakes? Yes. What happens if we don't? Liable to, destined to, it repeat itself, right? Going around the mountain. And so there's, there's some mistakes and some things that have happened in life. I do not. I ask the Lord every day, oh, Lord... This is, I think, where uh, sometimes Catholicism could have some good thing about the repentant thing, you know, where you go in and you repent and you repent and just like you can like clean it out. And so we should do that. We should always check ourselves, right? It says examine your heart. So that's where they got that, that they're always being sure to repent from the, to, the, to the Lord. We can repent to him directly. But they didn't know that anything was wrong in the boat. Even at the lower levels, when, as, the part, as it was filling with water, um, the other guests were going about their evening, settling in uh, for good night's sleep. It wasn't until it was too late for so many, um, and the acts, the fact that lifeboats were sent out with not all the people in them, right? The captain made some bad decisions, and from there he tried to cover up some of his decisions until some of those, some people perished because he did not act quickly enough. But praise the Lord, there were other people on that boat that did take action that went about, and some of them were not part of the crew. They were people that were seeing what was happening, and they were running back into the lower levels and the other levels, and they were trying to get as many people out and save as many people as they could because they knew what was going to happen. And there were men um, who, who gave their seat away to people, knowing it was the last boat that was going out and sacrificed their own lives for the lives of others. And it's this type of heart I always want to have, that no matter what the adversity is that stands before me, that I will not put myself first, but that I will put other people first always. And that's not always an easy thing to do, amen? Especially in adversity. Have you ever heard it said, you can't build a ship in a storm? Right. Well, life has brought me to a place to where I kind of disagree with that. I've gone through a lot of storms, and I, it may be a piece of driftwood, but praise the Lord, it's going to be my boat. You know, finding something. And it may not be pretty. It may not be pretty, 
Because, I mean, you know, let's face it, who has an ark in their backyard, right? <laughs> Noah. <laughs> but nobody else, right, had the ark. And so, um, you know, but that's true in that sometimes in adversity, you are called upon in that moment to rise up to something greater inside you and move forward. I've read about it in history books, the Bible. I see it on the news. I've lived it in my own life. When the unexpected happens at that very moment when hopelessness, my mind tries to grip with what am I going to do, right? And the reality of what has just happened, whatever it is, I've got many. You've all, we all have many things we could relate to. And that split second that followed how it would determine if I would make it through or if I would give in to it. My heart moves to make those thoughts a liar. Always. We need to learn how to shut the liar's mouth. A lot of times that's ours. We have to shut ours first and not go through the adversity and talk about the problem and talk about the adversity and talk about how horrible things are, but in looking for how I'm going to get through this, right? How am I going to make that next step to move forward? So many times the best way to shut the liar's mouth, of course that's the devil, right, is not, not through words at all, but by our action or our reaction to move away from the situation of adversity. And sometimes you can't escape it, right? I mean, sometimes there is no escaping whatever it is that you're in the middle of. It's like being in the middle of, and, and, and that, you know, how you can be in the middle of the eye of the storm and it's all calm. Oh no, it's, it's like disasters throwing you all over the place. You're like on the edge going around with the tornado, not necessarily in the middle. And trying to find that peace can be a difficult place to be. To seek direction from the followers of Christ is the best thing I can say. And they're sitting right next to you. I don't know who they are. So whoever you're sitting next to, when you're going through adversity and you need to seek direction and um, that is going on, contact someone. Let them, you know, somebody that, that you know will stand with you. Who's your Jeremiah? Who are you calling when you need a word from the Lord and you don't feel like you can see or hear? And there's nothing, you know what, there's nothing wrong with that. I am not saying anything about anybody here because I have been there. I've been in a place where I'm thinking, oh Lord, have mercy. What am I going to do? Right? But then I stop and I check myself I feel the emotion of fear, anxiety, and worry. And I remember that these things aren't from God. Amen? Those things aren't from God. So now, I got to get to the other side. In Jeremiah 23, 28, he talks about the false prophets. Um, he says, let the, these false prophets tell their dreams, but let my true messengers faithfully proclaim my every word. You are his faithful messengers. And there are a lot of people that are deceiving people out there that, that are not living the way that they should, are not concerned about humanity. But then there's his faithful followers. And so it doesn't matter about the social media and everything else. I saw a deal on uh, Facebook. I don't know if it's true. Okay, so if it's not, I apologize. But apparently Matt Damon is moving back to Australia because he doesn't like Donald Trump. So I post on there, I wonder if the rest of Hollywood that doesn't like him is moving with him. And then I thought, well, no, that wasn't very nice after I hit send, right? We cannot escape negativity. It's out there. It is just going to be out there. There are going to be people that do not like your church, that do not like your employer. There are going to be people that do not like you. And I used to say... Bless the hearts. Cashley is a great example. She's so precious, and I can see her, so I can use her today. She won't mind. Um, she's so precious, and she's so sweet, and she's so beautiful, and she has a family that loves her, and I know she's going to be an amazing woman of God. I know that because I know her family. 
She's destined to be an amazing woman of God. Amen? Amen. But you know, there's going to be people out there that they're going to hurt her feelings. There's going to be somebody that doesn't want to be her friend. Right? Do you remember that? And I think that's just sad that the whole world isn't like that. Amen? And um, we know that those people, they grow up <laughs> to be people who don't want to be your friend. And that's okay. Pray for them. Amen? Amen? And he goes on and he talks about that there's a difference between the straw and the wheat. Or in some translations it says the grain. The true prophets and the false prophets are different, or as different as straw and wheat. Straw is useless for food. And this is what Jeremiah is relating here in this uh, prophecy. Uh, and cannot com uh, compare by to nourishing wheat. To share the gospel is a great responsibility. The way we present it and live it will encourage people either to accept it or to reject it. So whether it's from the pulpit, in a class that you teach, which you share with your friends on Facebook, we must accurately communicate and live our God's word alive. As you share God's word with friends and neighbors, they will look for its effectiveness in your life. Unless it has changed you, why should they let it change them? If you preach it, make sure you live it. Amen. Father, I just thank you for your words of encouragement today, Father. I thank you that we are the faithful messengers here today. And that we are those who, Father, even in captivity of, of the things of our past and our lives, that we were not slaves. We were not enslaved, Father. That our hearts became stronger. The word became bigger in us. May that never change. May we use all of our life's experiences today, Father, as we move forward to glorify you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you need anything from the Lord today, if you need prayer, if you need healing in your body, um, words of encouragement, hug, um, I'll be here. Other people are here, though. You can, you know, share the love. Amen. Have a great week. I hope you've listened to the word uh, during this service so that you can have your life changed. You're, you'll see how the DNA of your entire life is about to change. Also, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never made him the Lord of your life. Paul says this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's very simple to do that. All I have to really do is say, Jesus is the Lord of my life and I believe that God raised him from the dead. That's exactly what Paul said. Many times we have people pray a prayer uh, so that we know that we've drawn a line in the sand and we've let everybody know that we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. So I want to do that with you right now so that you can literally say today is the day and whatever time it is wherever you're at watching you'll know that you've had a change in your life so say this with me you can bow your head and close your eyes or you can keep your eyes open uh, and uh, I, I always love what uh, Oop Schroner who is a prophet of God said he said if you're drowning in a swimming pool at the Holiday Inn you wouldn't want anybody to close their eyes. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're literally drowning in a swimming pool of sin someplace. So say this with me. Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for me. I confess my sin. I ask you to forgive me of them. And Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. 
And I commit today that I will live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, if you just did that, then what you just did is you invited Jesus Christ to live in your life, to be the Lord of your life, and you're going to see a complete change in every area of your entire life right now. If you've watched this broadcast, you also know that uh, what we've talked about at different times uh, through different broadcasts is, is finances. If we, the Bible tells us in Luke 6.38 that if we give, that he'll give back to us, pressed down, shaken together and running over to make room for more. Then it says, uh, right after that, and this is Luke 6.38, then it says, whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will be used to measure what is given back to you. So if you become a covenant partner with us today, there's many things that we do for outreaches here out of this church and out of the ministry, not only here in Weatherford, Texas, but all over the country and all over the world. We uh, have rodeo events right here in the arena where we have, uh, he paid your fees. Simply means that nobody pays to, to enter. They come, we have a devotional, it becomes an outreach opportunity. And we do that in rodeo arenas, horse show arenas, and roping arenas all over the United States. We drill wells and have uh, crusades in Nigeria, Cameroon, Togo, Uganda, and Tanzania. And by doing each one of those, uh, you become, and becoming a covenant partner with this ministry, you become a part of those outreaches. You take part in the reward in the end time, as well as you get back pressed down, shaken together, and running over to make room for more. Because you're a covenant partner, and this is good ground. Bible tells us in another place he gives back. Uh, this is in uh, Mark, the 10th chapter. It tells us that he gives back to us some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Well, this ground has been worked. It has is, is been fertilized. And, and I would expect a 100 fold return on that. So there's a uh, website that you've seen. Do two things. One, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, let us know at that website address and we'll send you some information so that you'll be able to walk that walk and succeed in life in your new Christian life. Also, if you give, there's a donate button right there. If you press that donate button and give, that seed gets planted into good ground, and it comes back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Kathleen and I pray every day over every partner of this ministry. So I want to make sure that we're able to pray for you and, and let us know the things that you may have need of in life so that we can bring them before the Father. Have a great day. Remember, Jesus loves you. We love you. And Jesus is Lord.